younger. So then, but but something miraculous happened. You did pull it all together and go to California. I came home from Long Beach and um, I thought I've got to get my act together. And so once again, I um, had my plane ticket and I went to California. Had no idea this time what I was going to do. I, I got a hotel and um, started trying to find a job. And people that I met out there said, you, you have to get a job job, like a server in a restaurant. Or, you know, most of them got jobs that were in restaurants because it's flexible. You could work at night and interview during the day. And so I started answering ads in the Hollywood Reporter and um, going on all kind of auditions and not getting any jobs and you know your money's not gonna last very long if you're in a hotel so um, I uh, called my mom and I said maybe somebody from my pageant days would have a connection out here and could kind of help give me a little bit of a um, advice and she said yeah that's a good idea you should call them and so a man named Bob Parkinson, uh, who was one of the producers of the Miss USA pageant, and um, um, I'm thinking of the guy who produced the Georgia pageant. Can't think of his name, but anyway, I called them, and I said, "Do you know of anything going on out here that I could audition for?" And they're like, "Yeah, um, there's two men who are producing a play, a musical for." Um, a casino in Atlantic City. They were just now building, I think they had built three casinos there. One of them was the Caesars. And um, they, I auditioned for them, and Bernie Wayne was one of the men. He wrote, There She Is, Miss America. So I got a job there. So for the first, um, like, eight months that I lived in California, I actually traveled with the show. So then I came back, and I'm um, auditioning again. I'm doing singing telegrams, and so I have car trouble. And I took my car to this um, little shop at the corner. I lived in West Hollywood. And while they're working on it, I'm going to go shopping. And so I um, went to the traffic light, and I'm standing there waiting for it to change. And this car is sitting there waiting for it to change. And so this man looked out and said, hello, and I said, hello, and he said, oh, where are you from with that accent? And I said, Georgia. He said, what are you doing out here? I told him I'm trying to, I want to be an actress. And he said, well, are you having any luck? And I said, no, not really. I'm just, you know, auditioning, singing telegrams in a gorilla suit. And he said, well, here, take my card. I might know somebody that is hiring. And, um, Reluctantly, I took the card and he drove away. So I later called some friends and people in Los Angeles and asked if they knew this man. And they were like, oh yeah, he's a really, he's a sound, straight up guy, producer. So I called him. That and, actually has an Elvis connection. And I didn't know at the time, but his name, uh, that he had an Elvis connection. But his name was Steve Bender. And uh, I called him. So tell them who Steve Bender is. Steve Bender produced the 68 Come Comeback Special, special of That's Elvis. Right. I had no knowledge of that at this time. And he had no knowledge of me having had a relationship with Elvis. All he knew is I'm a girl standing on the street corner once again, crossing the street. And so I called you Steve. You keep having all these, um, these uh, serendipity moments. Providential. Yeah, yeah, providence, yeah. Because it's it's too um, unusual to just happen. It had to be orchestrated. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's just because um, I'm on my path. I'm doing what you do. I'm interviewing. I'm taking classes, you know, comedy classes, writing classes. And then over here, this happens. And this ends up being the interview. Not I'm trying to do my thing. And so along the way, all, all these things come to you. So I called Steve Bender, and he said, let's meet for dinner. I want to tell you an idea I have. And he said, you drive your own car. I don't want you to think anything is wrong. So I did. I met him at a restaurant in Beverly Hills. And he said, I have a friend who produces the Hee Haw Show. 
and I think you would be perfect for that show. And he said, I'm going to call them and set up an interview for you. And I can't guarantee anything because I can only open this door. And I said, that would be great. So he gave me a phone number, and he said, I want you to call them tomorrow. So I called, and Sam Lovello answered the phone. He's the producer for the Heehaw Show. And he said, um, yeah, Steve Bender called and said that we should see you, that you might be good for the show. But I have to tell you, we're not hiring. But we would love for you to come in and read for us, and then we'll, you know, keep you in mind. So I said, okay. And I went in for an interview. And the, the people who had started Hee Haw, uh, Frank Papiot, Sam Lovello, the producer, uh, Barry Edelman, writer, they were all in the room. And they said, here's the deal. There's two girls who are pregnant, and we don't know if they're going to come back after they have their babies, because this is, I think it was their first child each. And you, we want you to read their parts. And so it was Marianne Gordon and Linda Thompson. So, and another Elvis connection. Yes. And a little bit of an awkward Elvis connection. Very, because I didn't even bring it up. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> so I read both their parts, and um, they said, Thank you. That was really good. And again, like we said, we're not hiring, but we appreciate your time and we're going to keep your name on the file. So I left there excited that I got to see him, but not excited that I was, I was thinking, I just got to impress them to the place. They're going to hire somebody anyway, but um, it's not how it was. But um, about a week and a half later, after another crazy week of interviewing with um, people who we're not who they say they are, and you you wade through a lot of stuff. You know you have to you have to be smart and um, be careful when you're really in any business. But I, um, there's a lot of shysters. In yeah, Hollywood. things are not always what they seem. Mm -hmm. So I went on an interview where it turned out this um, wealthy Iranian man. And on the, under the guise of needing um, a girl for a billboard in Las Vegas, turned out that he just needed a new wife. And he offered me a five-year contract to be his wife with a salary and all the setup and college money and all that. And I'm um, like, oh, my gosh. You know, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm out here to be an actress. You know, if, and that's not part of it. So I left there. Flew back home uh, to L.A. where I live. And I went in. My answering machine was blinking. And I went over there and hit the button. And the voice, God, I get, <laughs> I get emotional thinking about it. Um, well, it was an incredible <laughs> turn of events. It was. It was the um, producer of Hee Haw. And he said, can you come back in? We are um, considering offering you a job. And so I went back to their office, and he said, we want to give you a five-year contract and hire you to be a Hee Haw Honey. He said, the girls are coming back to work. They both want to continue on the Hee Haw Show, but we want to hire you. And I thought, two days ago, I could have made a dumb mistake because they were both five-year things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this was what was meant to be for me. And um, thanks to Steve Bender. So, and it turns out the show is filmed in Nashville. So I have to fly to Nashville to work. And um, on the first week of taping, I find myself in the girls' dressing room alone uh, with Linda Thompson. And I'm like, oh, this is a little awkward. And we didn't say anything to each other. And then finally, she turned around and looked at me and said, I remember you. And I'm like, you do? from where <laughs> and she said I remember you dated Elvis and um, you know we talked a little bit more but after that the ice was broken and um, later on we became friends and um, she and Bruce fixed me up with Bruce's manager and we double dated a lot and um, you know enjoyed each other's company Elvis was never a topic of discussion never came up you know, between us, anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I worked on the Hee Haw Show with her for five years. And um, 
then, as my book says, at the the end of my contract with Hee Haw is uh, where my book ends, and um, my new life begins. Right. And hopefully that'll be a sequel. So let's talk about the book. Here is the book, Hollywood Lights, Nashville Nights. And this is a double book, Victoria Holman and Diana Goodman. So this is Victoria at the top with Buck Owens. She got on the Hee Haw show through Buck Owens. And this is you with Elvis on the bottom, but you got on the Hee Haw show through Steve Bender. Steve Bender. Which was, still had an Elvis connection. He produced exactly. the 68 comeback. So this book, when we read it, is not half about you, half about her. It's like a chapter and then two chapters. A chapter from you and two for her. Tell, tell me about that. Well, the first um, segment deals with how I met Elvis and how all that went and some other stories of um, interesting people and situations that came up in my life. And then the second segment is Victoria and how she met Buck Owens and how he impacted her life and um, helped her, you know, further her career. And then the third segment is me again, and it's more about Hee Haw, how I got to the Hee Haw show, things that went on during that time. And then the fourth segment is about Victoria and her life uh, during the Hee Haw time as well. And we met on the Hee Haw show. And, so y'all um, were both Hee Haw honeys. Yes. And you corresponded. She lives in Nashville, and you she live in California. Atlanta. Atla I'm sorry. You, so you're back in Atlanta then. Okay. Yes, I moved so, back to Atlanta. Okay, so um, that's how y'all wrote the book. You corresponded. You said that you would spend every Monday night. Mm -hmm. For a year, every Monday night on the phone, like a conference call. And we would um, tape interviews, conversations, and I would take notes. And um, like through the week, I would write down more things about what I wanted to talk about. And I would talk about them to her, and we would go back and forth sometimes hours and that's how we but a few years before that we had gotten together and taped our conversations um at her home laying in her pool we taped conversations and talked about what, how we wanted the book to go and um what it, we were going to say and then somehow they all got erased when we got ready to actually start the writing process, mm -hmm. the tapes wouldn't come through. It was empty tape, so I, we don't know what happened. But, um, you know, and when years pass, you try to remember all the details the way that you thought you remembered them or the way that you said them. And I had written a lot on paper anyway, the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had to redo lots of the um, events and um just talk them through, and then she would write them into the book. And so my part is as told to her, and um, then her part is written by her. So then, and you started the book. The, the idea behind the book started in two thousand eight. Uh huh. So you theoretically worked on the book for ten years. Right, ten years from the time I wrote the first. I like to call them chapters just because it would be a story and mm -hmm. then there would be another story and I called it chapter two. And um, my husband encouraged me and inspired me to write my stories down for all the people that loved Elvis, that wanted to know about him, people that, and really I didn't have anything written very much about Hee Haw at that time. It was mostly about Elvis. And then... Um, have some girlfriends that said you you've got to write a book you you know they just really encouraged me to write a book and share um, information that other people might not know about Elvis that and and include all the hee-haw things so then I started to write that and um, then I kind of tabled it for a little while to and I put a lot of things on Facebook and then I copyrighted it just to see what kind of response and I got such a favorable response that I started to look for a, like a co-writer or someone to help write it for me, and an editor mm -hmm. and a publisher by, on my own. And I interviewed a couple of people. I even sent them the information, and they um, 
one guy worked for UGA in, in publishing and he just um, could not get to the place where we needed to be and so I ended that relationship and I looked again for another uh, writer, someone to help me put it together. I really wasn't sure what I needed. But then a few years after that, Victoria saw my things on Facebook. And she called and said, you, you don't need to put your story in public. You need to put it in a book. And then let people buy it from you. And not just so you can sell something, but so that it's in a form that you can get it out to people. And, you have a legacy. Yeah, and so she actually helped put in play the um, process that got us to where we are today. She and I started working together, and then she came up with the idea of maybe including her stories to make it a bigger book and appeal to a broader audience. Because, you know, the Buck Owens and um, the things that people could relate to with her part of the story. And so... We um, signed a contract with each other, and we had advisement from, I um, can't even think of his name, he's, he's got a thank you in there, Kenny Rogers, entertainment attorney. Um, we went to him, and he advised us, and he said, you know, you, you girls should do a wholesome sex in the city. That's what it <laughs> sounds like, all these girls and all these happenings, and, and I said, is there even a, such a thing? But he envisioned a television show. Even a TV movie, you know, see like a Netflix or anything, that um, was a wholesome version of Sex and the City. Mm -hmm. I had never seen that show. I went home and watched it. I'm like, oh my gosh. It, it, yeah, it had to be a definitely a wholesome. <laughs> that, that show was too much for me. But So he encouraged us along the way and tried to help us make contact. And then one night, Victoria... Um, invited me to come to a benefit in Nashville and um, her husband couldn't attend and so she invited me to come and we sat next to um, a man he was Andy Devine's son was it Dennis I forget what it, do you remember Andy Devine? I remember the name. Yeah. Was he Jingles on um, Roy Rogers or I forget that whole but he had written a book, and his publisher was Bear Manor Media. And so we thought, hmm. Um, we considered and looked into that, you know, and but we had an agent in New York by this time, and she was not really, uh, we didn't feel like she was making enough effort to get our book out there. And she said she, you know, was not getting any, um, Nobody wanted to um, jump in on it. So at the end of that contract, we got together and said, you know what, let's just find our own publisher. And if we need an agent or somebody to help us negotiate millions of dollars one day, we will. But for now, let's just, we didn't want to self-publish if we didn't have to. Mm -hmm. It involves a lot of money and a lot more steps. And um, so... We submitted um, the material to Bear Manor. We went back to where we had met, you know, the man who had written that book. And um, he, he also published Charlotte Ray from um, The Facts of Life. And a lot of um, older Western um, people. And so he sent us um, notice back and said he's interested in publishing our book. So in June of 2017, we signed a contract with him, and then June 14th, 2018, we had a book in our hands. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, God. So it hadn't been out long, and no. this, friends, is another Elvis untold story. So all of you people that love Elvis and want to know what went on, this is a way that you can get some new information. She was clearly there. <laughs> you saw her in the photographs. Pick proof. <laughs> she has the stories, but if you want the in-depth version of it, you got to get the book. Got to get the book. <laughs> That's right. And you can buy the book through John Daly through uh, ElvisPawnshop.com. Right. And uh, John sign has them. autographed copies of it. He does. Is that I right? Signed them myself. She signed it. So get Hollywood Lights and Nashville Nights, friends. Go to ElvisPawnshop.com. 
and pick it up right now. He's got signed copies hot and ready to go. <laughs> right? Yes, thank you. Thank you.